This is Karen Brewster, and I'm here with Jim Reardon in the recording studio at the Rasmussen Library at University of Alaska Fairbanks, and it's May 26, 2009, and this is for the Wildlife Society's Conserving Our Wildlife Heritage Conservation Project. Thank you, Jim, for taking the time. I know you're in a hurry to get home to Homer. My pleasure. <laughs> so, uh... I think we'll just get started. Um, have you tell us a little bit of your background of when you were born and where and your growing up? Well, we could take a long time on that. You know? I was born in California, Petaluma, 1925. Finished high school there. My father was a graduate of Oregon State and uh, while I was in high school, we learned that Oregon State had a new program of fish and game management. So when I completed high school, I went to Corvallis and started the program, fish and game management. I went one semester, it was during World War II, and I dropped out to join the Navy. I spent uh, two and a half years in the Navy, served overseas in the Central Pacific aboard a destroyer escort as a sonar operator. After the war, of course, I went to, back to Corvallis and uh, on the GI Bill completed my program there in 1948, receiving a bachelor's degree in fish and game management. From there I went to the University of Maine to do graduate work. And uh, I, I had an assistantship at the Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit there. It was a two-year assistantship during which I worked on various main species. My thesis was on woodcock, an animal I had never seen until I went to Maine. What's and a woodcock? Woodcock is an upland game bird. And uh, I got really interested in the woodcock, but uh, I had more fun and more enjoyment in Maine getting acquainted with black ducks and white-tailed deer and uh, the other flora and fauna, the flora of which is fairly similar to that of Alaska. Well, <clears throat> during my last summer at Oregon State, I applied for and received a summer job with the Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska. That was in 1947. And I came to Alaska in uh, May and spent three months at Chignik on the Alaska Peninsula as a fishery patrol agent. They gave me a, or a, assigned me a 30-foot patrol boat and told me what the regulations were. And my job was to enforce those for the salmon fishery of the summer. That was when I first saw brown bear and salmon beyond numbers that you could believe. Uh, ptarmigan, lots of eagles. I ran into a wolverine one day. What, on the Alaska Peninsula? On the Alaska Peninsula. Wow. It was a wonderful summer. That kind of provided the key to my coming back to Alaska. In two years, I completed my master's degree at Maine and applied for a position I heard was open at the University of Alaska for someone to organize a wildlife department and to teach. And I applied for it, and I suspect that the fact that I'd already been to Alaska had a lot to do with my being hired for that job. So I arrived at Fairbanks in July of 1950 and uh, 
until school started, I got a job with the Alaska Railroad as a gandy dancer. That's a trail, a, a, a railroad term for uh, uh, working on the tracks. Oh. You ride one of those little cars along the rail and the crew lines up the railroads and and uh, gets the railroad ties in order and you would push one of those push cart things no no <laughs> no we had a gasoline engine on ours <laughs> <clears throat> so i applied for this job here and and arrived here i was 25 years old and uh I had my notes from Oregon State and the University of Maine, and I, I was given free reign to organize the department and to establish the, the classes and the studies and the programs for the uh, four-year degree in wildlife management. And I taught here four years. And during that time, I'd be in the old main building over here, which is now gone. And I'd look out at the Alaska Range. And I'd gone through many of the books in the uh, Alaska room of the library. And I wanted to be out there instead of behind a blackboard. And I had started writing, freelance writing. And I'd sold quite a few magazine articles and was doing fairly well that way. And I made a very foolish move, probably, in the eyes of many. I resigned my job at the university. By then, I was a full professor, head of my department, and uh, I enjoyed it, but I, I had adventure in my mind. So I combined writing and I got a guide's license, and I guided non-resident hunters, and I wrote stories about our hunts, and I wrote stories about Alaska, and I moved to Homer. I like the sea. Mm -hmm. And I moved to Homer in 1956. And uh, writing really didn't provide a living for me and my family. I had a wife and three kids by the time we got to Homer. So uh, when a temporary job came up with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game as an observer on a seismic operation in Cook Inlet, uh, I accepted it as a, as a temporary, just a, I wasn't going to be there long. Well, we went the full length of Cook Inlet and even into turning an arm with four huge seismic boats and I had uh, a steel boat called the I can't think of it it was a big tender from Kodiak salmon tender and uh, I was authorized to stop the operation anytime they were damaging any of the resource they used black powder at that time. This was in 1958-59. And uh, I stayed with that operation until the fall. And then statehood came around in 1959. And uh, the fellow who was to be the area biologist for commercial fisheries for Cook Inlet, Bud Weberg, was assigned to Homer, and he was authorized to hire an assistant. He talked me into the job, so I was assistant area biologist for commercial fisheries. Fortunately, when I was at Oregon State, I took a lot of fishery courses as well as game courses, so I was kind of prepared for that. And in the summer at Chignik with the salmon fishery, Gave me some knowledge of that. Now, when you were in Cook Inlet with the seismic, that was the beginnings of the oil exploration there? That was the first time seismic operation 
had taken place in Alaska, to my knowledge, of that type. And the, the black powder, of course, was abandoned after a few years. But they used it for some years. They had one bad accident after I, I left the uh, job as observer. A couple of uh, the crewmen were killed on one boat when a black powder exploded aboard the boat. And now you were observing impacts on which species? On fish? On fish. Anything that, salmon particularly. Uh, the black powder killed a lot of cod and mostly cod, but there were a few other species. We never did kill an adult salmon that I observed. And uh, the jaguar was the tender that I rode mm -hmm. during that entire operation. From there, the operation went down to Yakutat, Yakutaga area, with some seismic work. And uh, I left the they left the state after the, or the territory after that. Now, how do you observe the impact on the salmon in Cook Inlet? I mean, it's well, you just ride around looking for them on the surface. Oh, I see. If they're killed, if they're damaged, well, they'll they'll come to the surface. You certainly can't see them swimming in the water. No, 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 impossible. Okay. So, I want the <coughs> statehood came, <coughs> and. Congress decided that Alaska was not prepared to manage its fish and game as a state and gave the state one year to prepare itself. Well, the state had the, the Territorial Department of Fisheries, which actually had been organized with the hopes of statehood and eventual management of the resource. For the summer of 1959, I worked as an observer of the Fish and Wildlife Service and their management of salmon in Cook Inlet. Um, their management was poor. respect well let, let me let me give you some background <clears throat> in 1936 the entire state catch of salmon reached a peak I don't remember the exact number but in 1959 the last year under federal management, the total catch was 25 million salmon. It had decreased to that level from over 100,000. Okay. State management turned that around, and I'll discuss that in a minute, okay. so that today it is not unusual to have and harvest a catch of 200 million. Wow. 25 million on our last year of federal management to 200 million <clears throat> today. We don't reach that every, every year, but we have reached it many times. And it's very simple. The Fish and Wildlife Service operated this way. <clears throat> They held hearings in Seattle and some hearings in Alaska prior to the forthcoming salmon seasons. And salmon was the primary resource at the time. Right. There was no king crab to speak of. And they were uh, still using those. There were dungeon nests. And, and they were using the fish traps, those big. They were using fish traps. Brought, caught a lot of fish, didn't they? They caught the bulk of the fish. And this was one of the sticking points on statehood. In Cook Inlet, uh, they operated out of Anchorage. Uh, 
and they had a Grumman Goose for the pilot. And weekly, they would take that airplane and fly down the inlet, and mainly they were enforcing regulations. That is, that traps would be closed, the gill netters would be ashore, the gill nets for the set net fishermen would be ashore, and they would uh, land at the various canneries and pick up fish tickets, which reported the total catch for the inlet. They tried to stay on that. They emphasized recording the catch when they should have been looking at the escapement. Mm -hmm. They tried or they, they, they thought they were stream surveying with the goose. Well, the Grumman Goose is a big twin engine amphibian. It's an awkward airplane to fly low with. And uh, they put bubble windows on them so that observers could peer down. But at the speed that they flew, the altitude they had to fly for safety, mm -hmm. stream surveying, counting, counting fish in clear water streams was uh, not accurate. It was not possible. When the state acquired management, 1960, we went through all of the material the Fish and Wildlife Service had in Anchorage. They'd done virtually no research over the years. There'd been some tagging of red salmon to see where the fish near Calgon Island were bound. They had a counting station on the Russian River, which is connected to the Kenai River. And that was about it. They had no idea what their escapement was during or after the salmon season. On one occasion, I remember a cannery operator telling the biologist in the goose, we, we went ashore, and and uh, picked up fish tickets, that there were sure a lot of fish in the river because there are a lot of jumpers. And he was judging the escapement on the number of jumpers in the river, <coughs> which is not valid at all. The regulations were established in the fall and winter prior to the season and approved in Washington. They were rarely changed during the season. Only in a dire emergency with a major fishery were they ever changed at all. And then, in order to make a change, the change had to be published in the Federal Register, which took a minimum of 42, maybe 72 hours. By then, usually with a salmon run, that's done. It's over with. Right. You, you accomplish nothing. <clears throat> the first commissioner of Fish and Game, Andy, Clarence Andy Anderson, and the second was Walter Kirkness. Both of them were experienced and wise men. They delegated to the field biologists the authority to make field announcements to open and close fishing seasons and to close areas to fishing. In other words, if there was not escapement in a stream, the area biologists had the authority to announce fishing ends in this area till we get escapement. And the announcement, 12 hour announcement, and it's closed. And, and this applied throughout the, 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 the state by then. Which sounds like a good thing. That was the reason that fish came back. I'll, I'll give you one little example. <clears throat> There's an area in the outer district, so called, the outer coast of the Kenai Peninsula, called Port Dick. It had a pink salmon and a chum salmon 
There are four streams there. And it was an important salmon fishery for saners at the time. One of the commercial fishermen that I knew well told me this story. He usually fished in this Port Dick area. He said one year the season was opened and he and other boats were there waiting. There were no fish. No fish in the bay at all. No fish in the streams, but the season was open. They stayed and stayed. Finally, on the date that the season closed, as they were steaming out of the bay, the fish were coming in in great numbers. They didn't, the Fish and Wildlife Service ignored them. They did not make any adjustment. The fish piled up in the streams, and the fishermen, this guy that I talked to, his name is Jake McClay, he's a fisherman at Homer, said he went back afterwards just to look, and there were windrows of dead spawned out salmon all around the shores of Port Dick. There could have been a good harvest, but there wasn't. Right. Now, <clears throat> under state management, and Bud Weberg soon left, and I became area biologist. And this is an area from uh, beyond Seward uh, to Katmai Monument and all of Cook Inlet, including Susitna drainage. Oh. So it's an area big as some states. Right. I had one assistant to begin with. When salmon season came around and the Board of Fisheries at the time Board of Fish and Game, put in the book, Port Dick to be opened by field announcement. So when it was time for salmon to arrive, I would get in a super cub and fly to Port Dick and fly up and down these clear water streams at a slow speed and about 300 feet off of the water so you can see the fish. Estimate what was there when we had escapement, I would go down there, I would announce there will be an opening on such and such a day, and it would be open at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'd fly down there at 8 o'clock in the morning, the boats would all be prepared, I'd fire a flare, and they'd start fishing. And as long as there were fish there and the escapement was good, the season would remain open. But if escapement dropped, I would make an announcement and close it. Now apply this to the hundreds and hundreds of small streams and bays throughout the territory, or the state then. Right. And you can see, and this applied even to the big fisheries like Bristol Bay and the major fisheries of Cook Inlet and so on. This is why the fish returned. This is why the salmon came back. We were very successful. Now one more little beating on the chest, I guess, as it is. Cook Inlet has a lot of silty streams in which salmon run up. The uh, Kenai River, the Kasilof River, the Susitna. Impossible to count salmon in them, visually. We tried using fish wheels to sample. We tried using nets to sample. It was pretty unsatisfactory. We, during the salmon season, we really didn't know how many fish we had on the spawning grounds. Having been a sonar operator during World War II, I knew something about sonar. And I talked to the commissioner, worked Walt Kirkness at the time. I said, you know, I think sonar could be used to count fish in this silty water. He said, go for it. He said, uh, follow that up. So I wrote to every American sonar operator at the time. Japan wasn't making that equipment of those years. One company responded is Bendix Company. They sent a gentleman up here. His name is Al Menon, M-E-N-I-N. He is a genius. He came up with one thought in mind 
to find out if sonar could detect salmon in silty streams. So he came to the Homer office. It was August. It was the season was pretty well running down. And I assigned him one of my temporaries, a fellow named Ray Baxter, who eventually became an uh, area biologist for the state of Alaska. And Ray took this fellow up to the Kasilov River, Silty River. He set his sonar unit up. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, there weren't any salmon running. But fortunately, Ray was a very capable guy. He went over to a nearby stream, Crooked Creek, and caught a bunch of silver salmon that were still running there. He took those silver salmon, put them on a line, and pulled them past the sonar counter. Bang, bang. They showed up clearly. The sonar operates by echoing off of the fish bladder. They don't work on a fish that doesn't have, have an air bladder. And salmon have an air bladder. So we had the answer. Sonar works in silly water. Menon went back to California, came back the following year with a workable salmon sonar counter. That was the beginning. Today, virtually every major stream and a lot of the minor streams in Alaska have sonar counters in them. It makes a tremendous difference when in the middle of a season you're catching lots of fish and you know how many fish you have in the stream. You can adjust your seasons. And well, I'd, I'd say that's a major contribution that you had that idea. Well, I'm proud of the fact that I'm the grandfather of the yeah. Alaska sonar fish count. That how you how you thought of that is pretty amazing. Well, being a sonar operator, it was natural. To, you know, it just is happenstance. Right. Something I got out of being in the service and uh, having bombs dropped on me and so on by the Japs. So uh, that's that's a story on the salmon, basically, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Then while you were area biologist in Homer, what other things were you involved with? Well, we got involved with the oil industry. They put platforms in Cook Inlet, started finding oil and pumping oil. We had a lot of trouble. From these platforms, they would dump plastic cups and plastic of all kinds, scrap wood. Uh, the shores of Cook Inlet for a while was lined with those little plastic coffee cups. Mm -hmm. They have an oil spill from time to time. Fishermen would report them to me and I would call the oil people and say, hey, you just spilled some oil. Yeah, we know, we it'll rush off. And it got pretty bad for a while. Uh, I would get in an airplane and go look and uh, with the big tides in the inlet, unless it's a pretty good sized spill, it's hard to find them. But when a big one came along, and, and they, they did occasionally, uh, it was upsetting. So I finally wised up. Instead of going to the oil industry, I went to the newspapers. Headlines. On one occasion with uh, Governor Hickel, uh, I seized a, an oil tanker. Oh. It was cruising through Kachemak Bay on a Sunday, and one of the fishermen out there saw it trailing oil behind it. The fisherman called me from Seldovia, and uh, I immediately called the commissioner of fish and game, who immediately called the governor who told the commissioner of fish and game, you tell that area biologist to go and arrest that ship. Well, I had no law enforcement training. I didn't have any idea. And it was bound for Nikiski, where there's a, uh, they were loading and unloading there. Mm 
as it turned out, the, the uh, law enforcement branch met them there, tied the ship up. It was the overseas Rebecca. And the story I finally learned was that the oil tank for the kit for the galley on the on the ship had was being filled and continued to be filled and overflowed and the oil was leaving a constant stream behind that ship the full length of Kachemak Bay and then on up Cook Inlet and uh, there's quite a hurrah about that well that kind of convinced the oil industry and things settled down and uh, they, they cleaned up their act after a while. Now, <clears throat> to go back to maybe a little my background, I spent uh, 10 years as area biologist, commercial fisheries. Alaska Magazine hired me to be their outdoors editor. I'd been writing freelance weekends and on my own time while I worked for the state. Now this was a permanent job. So I resigned as a biologist and went to work as a editor writer, a job I held for 20 years. Um, I had no sooner resigned and taken this job than uh, Governor Egan appointed me to the Board of Fish and Game. Now at that time there was the Board of Fish and Game that handled all wildlife, all fisheries, and the guide licensing. And I served on that board for five years until 1975, at which time the legislature split the Board of Fish and Game into the Board of Fisheries and the Board of Game. By then, uh, Jay Hammond was governor, and he'd been a friend of mine when I lived here in Fairbanks and taught. He used to come out here to the university and lecture to my classes at my request. And uh, the area biologist in Cook Inlet is always in hot water because of the high population there. Mm -hmm. So Jay had been on many of the resources committees that I'd had to talk to and be with. So uh, go a step further, uh, my wife and Bella Hammond went to the same high school at the same time in Dillingham. <laughs> So we, we had a, a kind of a close relation. Anyway, to add even beyond that, Jim Brooks was uh, commissioner of fishing game, had been one of my students here at the same time. So when, <laughs> this is kind of funny. When uh, the board of game and board of fisheries were established, Brooks called, he says, uh, the governor knows which board you want to serve on. I said, well, I would prefer the Board of Game. So I then served on the Board of Game until 1982 for seven years. So I put in 12 years altogether yeah. Yeah. watching what went on there. And just incidentally, in the mid-70s, uh, I was appointed to the National Advisory Committee on Oceans an atmosphere by President, the guy that preceded Carter. Uh, Ford. No. Hmm? Ford? Yeah. Yeah. President Ford. President Ford. Jerry. <laughs> he, he, I never talked to him, of course, but it was kind of a highfalutin board. There were people, a lot of college professors and professionals from Woodhole, Woodhole in Massachusetts, and uh, representatives from all the states, and recommendations from this board went direct to the White House. 
And, and yeah, so what kind of things did you do on that? We considered all kinds of things, like the fact that the uh, nation was building too many structures too close to the ocean on both seaboards. We talked about the lack of transport in the event of war. We didn't have many freighters, sea freighters. We talked about the uh, use of uh, uh, fish in the Bering Sea and the, the uh, conflict with the other nations. Uh, the cod fishery off of New England? Yes, we talked about New England's fishery. Uh, it was a it was an exciting and interesting time. Served on that for 18 months. And during those 18 months, I went to, flew to Washington, D.C. for a meeting and stayed for a week. And it was educational and and uh, in, I was very impressed by by the people that I operated with. So were there any particular decisions that that group made that were... Not while I was there that I could think of. I was, of course, a, a recent member, and uh, the others had been through a lot, and it took a while to get up to speed with them. Yeah. What about when you were on the board of Fish and Game or Board of Game? Were there key issues that you can remember that went through there? Well, we got into the subsistence problems. and. <clears throat> It got very, very involved. Now, immediately after statehood, Governor Egan was very careful in appointing the 12 members of the Board of Fish and Game to appoint qualified Alaskans, people who were knowledgeable of the resource. They spent a lot of time on the problems. In fact, that is one reason that the boards were split, because by 1975, the meetings were lasting for a month to two months, and then stretching into almost three months. Well, these are unpaid people. Yeah. And it was... Uh, Difficult. I, at the time, I was uh, working for Alaska Magazine, and uh, it, it was informative to me as the outdoors editor. And I, I, I went direct from these meetings to writing about it in Alaska Magazine, reporting on it. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I was never uh, accused of having a. a unfair advantage, and that worked out very well. But the, what applied to the fishery also applied to the wildlife. That is, the game managers had the power of field announcement, could open and close, and could adjust quickly where needed. And uh, again, the, the uh, the old game commission operated in a slow manner. There were four members of the game commission, uh, one from each judicial district, plus the executive director who was the, uh, uh, Clarence Road was the last one. They would meet annually, make recommendations that went to Washington, and if Washington approved, and they generally did, this is what the game regulations would be. Mm -hmm. But there was no change, hardly from year to year. There were, the effort was mostly enforcement. They had enforcement agents scattered around. Uh, most of them were pilots, mm -hmm. and they were pretty thinly scattered. And these guys were dedicated. Though they're, they're, they're very fine quality people, but they were not biologists. And they had small budgets. Mm 
So, of course, this population of the state was small. But it was not intensive management or even truly scientific management. And when the state took over, for the first 10 years, from 1960 to into the 70s, I, in my opinion, we had probably the best fish and game management program of any state of the union. We had flexibility. We had top quality biologists. We had a, a good system with members of the boards that were truly interested and, and worked, worked hard. But uh, between Governor Egan, and Egan was excellent, Egan backed the commissioner and backed his boards, and Jay Hammond likewise. But the others, almost to a, to a person, went into politics. Politics influenced the Board of Fisheries and the Board of Game. Uh, I'll give you the most horrible example I can think of. And this came to me from Bob Hinman. Bob was one of my former students in wildlife here at the university. At the time I'm telling you about, he was assistant director of what was called the Division of Game. He was in his Juno office. A new board had been appointed. The old board had been dismissed by the new governor. A new board member arrived at Bob Hinman's office in Juno, walked in and said, well, I'm a new board member of the Board of Game. Where is the meeting to be held? Bob said, well, I'll show you. He got up and introduced himself and started to go upstairs. Well, hanging on the wall next to the stairs was a beautiful head mount of a bull caribou. You know, great. Great antlers, big white neck, just a beautiful thing. It, it had been mounted and contributed to the uh, department by Jim Farrell, uh, one of the game biologists. This new board member turned to Bob Henman. Oh my, what a beautiful animal. What is it, a moose? <laughs> A board of game member who didn't know what a caribou was. It's embarrassing. Yes, very. But it so happened that that board member had campaigned for that governor who's had a, well, big career since. The subsistence issue has been detrimental to good wildlife management. The Congress gave Alaska authority to manage its wildlife throughout the state. And that included on all federal lands. Mm -hmm. When the subsistence issue came up and this little hooker in there and the state constitution and the federal government retains now management over federal lands, you have a divided management. It is not working. The wildlife is suffering. It's not good management. Now, I think subsistence, that is the use of fish and game by Alaskans should be the most important single use. 
even above commercial use on salmon and crab or whatever, the commercial uses. But the present law doesn't really treat the wildlife fairly, nor does it treat the citizens fairly. I don't know what the answer is. There have been a lot of people who have tried to figure it out, and uh, I, I don't know. But it's very unfortunate that our wildlife and fisheries, wildlife especially, is, is uh, not managed with the best possible science and the best possible knowledge. Sadly, the state or the legislature has not been very generous with the Department of Fish and Game for wildlife management. Uh, the salaries are not equivalent to those that the federal people have. The federal personnel role keeps getting larger and larger and they keep pushing and pushing and uh, the, uh, there's hard feelings and I, I'm privy to this through uh, uh, quite a number of individuals, some of my former students and uh, of course they're <laughs> A lot of them are now retired. Anyway, uh, that kind of sums up the... the uh... And so, um, you said you did 20 years with Alaska Magazine, and then you've just, you've written books as well. Well, yes, <clears throat> I left Alaska Magazine. Well, during my time on Alaska Magazine, I came up with the idea of having a conservation department. They called it the Alaska Sportsman. Mm -hmm. And in it I was able to preach scientific management in a you know in a popular way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did was to get the game biologist to write articles about their work. And then I you know my job was to edit them so that they were uh, popular not quite so sciencey. Not yes. So the people would read it. Right. And I did a lot of that, and uh, I think it was Alaska Magazine went into most of the villages, and I think it had a had an impact. And at the same time, I'd written many many articles for Outdoor Life magazine, and I was the field editor for Outdoor Life. At the same time, I was outdoors editor for. Alaska now, Magazine. Is Outdoor Life a national magazine? It's a national magazine. Okay. But I left the magazine in, oh, in the 1980s and uh, turned to writing books. I've written, my latest book is my 24th. And I write biographies of old timers. The f One of the first ones I wrote was uh, a story of Frank Glazier, who was a predator control agent for the Fish and Wildlife Service here in Alaska. He arrived in Alaska in 1915 and was a field as a trapper and a hunter into the 30s, at which time he went to work for the Biological Survey, which turned into the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. And he left in 1955, but uh, that book, uh, Alaska's Wolfman, has done particularly well. It's sold about 30,000 copies so far. And I've written, I wrote a book with Sidney Huntington. Sidney was a fellow member of the Board of Fish and Game and the Board of Game. Sidney is from Galena. He's half Athabascan. And we became very good friends, still are. He's 92 now, and we're still in touch. He told many stories during board meetings, and uh, we usually uh, 
shared hotel rooms when we at board meetings. When I left the board, I said, Sidney, we've got to write a book about your life. Oh, he said, I haven't done anything interesting. Ha, <laughs> okay. So I said, I'll come to Galena. He said, when? I said, I'll come in the spring. Okay, well, I arrived there in the spring, and he had written, taken these yellow pads, line pads. He'd filled about four of them with his experiences. And I spent a week there with him with a tape recorder like that, no camera, and uh, went home and wrote the book, Shadows on the Koyukuk, A Native's Life Along the River, which has now sold more than 50,000 copies. It's done done very well. Well, what, what motivated you to start writing books? I've always been interested in the history of Alaskans. And old timers have their stories, and old timers are always dying and always will be dying, and old timers will always have stories. But uh, these people, in particular, like Sam O. White. Sam O. White was the world's first flying game warden, and I knew Sam when I first came here. And uh, I wrote a book, Sam O. White, Alaskan about his years as a game warden and then as a bush pilot. And those experiences are fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. I enjoy it especially after I get the writing done. <laughs> so I want to go back a little bit to how you got interested in doing uh, wildlife biology and fish and game work. You said your father had sort of done it, but what motivated you and inspired you? Well, like most people that got into fish and game management in the early years, I loved to hunt and fish. And as a boy, I grew up with a shotgun from the time I was 12 years old and a 22 hunting waterfowl, pheasants, deer in California. And I've continued that all of my life. When we came to Alaska, my, uh, we lived on, I raised my five kids on moose, caribou, actually eight kids. I married a second time and uh, my wife has three kids. So we raised eight kids and kicked them out of that log house that I built at Homer. Uh -huh. And I built it with my own hands and still live there after 49 years. Mm -hmm. Were there any individuals that you can think of who you, who particularly influenced you and shaped your career? There were three actually. Uh, Oregon State, one of the professors there, J.B. Long, had a great influence on me. Uh, he remained, even after I left uh, the school. I stayed in touch with him actually until the day he died. Uh, he was he was a marvelous teacher. Another was uh, the head of the department there, uh, Dimmick, Professor Dimmick. Uh, very, very encouraging people and um, my dad taught agriculture in the high school there, Petaluma, and he visited Dimmick before I started school there, and t to look into this new new profession. It's a new profession then, mm -hmm. and Dimmick and he got along well. And Dimmick realized that I had this background in agriculture, having watched my dad, and uh, we had livestock at our place. I I grew up milking two cows through yeah. high school. Yeah, well, Petaluma is quite a rural place. It, it was rural then, yeah. yeah. And uh, when it came to selecting courses, why he didn't push any of these agriculture courses on me because he figured I knew them. He, he selected other courses. Very thoughtful. And Howard Mendel, who was leader of the main cooperative wildlife research unit, was also a very good 
he he influenced me a lot. Uh, very fine man. I did my master's work under his direction, and stayed in touch with him until he died. Everybody's dying. Right. Well, unfortunately, it happens. Um, just a couple more questions for you. Well, I'd like to know more about your role in developing the wildlife management program here at UAF. Um, and, and how did you know what courses to develop and, and I what just, that was like? I programmed it. I followed the uh, course outline that the Oregon, uh, Oregon State used. Mm -hmm. I felt it was more appropriate to Western school and the Eastern and Western. I had both views. Mm -hmm. And I had better notes probably from the Western, from Oregon State. So I, I uh, in fact, before I came, on my way to Alaska, I stopped at Oregon State and went in and got a lot of the syllabus material from Jay Long and other teachers that I had there. And they were very helpful. And, you know, I came here prepared with material all ready to go. Uh -huh. So I was not quite as green as I might have been. Well, yeah, because you were very young. Yeah, I was, you know, when you first start teaching and you get these veterans, people who are in the service with you or before you or along with you. I uh, Sometimes I had some very, very bright students. George Schaller, who is nationally famous, was one of my students. Uh -huh. Another one wound up as uh, head of the ornithology, Tam Cade, at Cornell. Uh -huh. uh, two of them became commissioners of Fish and Game, Ron Skoog and Jim Brooks. Uh, Bob Hinman was assistant, mm -hmm. and uh, Jim King, who has an honorary doctorate from uh, U UAF, uh, had a marvelous wildlife career. And incidentally, uh, UAF gave me, I, I received an honorary doctorate in 2005 oh, of science based on my teaching, my writing, and my conservation work on the boards. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest honor I've ever had. So what was your favorite thing to teach? I liked teaching about waterfowl, waterfowl identification, waterfowl management, and big game management. Mm -hmm. and did you help get other faculty here to help grow the department? I was the only wildlife instructor as long as I was here. Okay. Yeah, because now it's quite a large department. Yeah. Uh, I was head of the department and the department okay. when I resigned. Mm -hmm. I arrived at the same time that uh, Brian Kessel did, uh -huh. 1950. And uh, most of the people who were here then are long gone. Right. What would you say is what you consider to be your most important contribution? Because you've been worked in if, these different areas. If you want it to one single thing, I think the sonar, salmon sonar, probably had more economic and biological impact than any other single thing. Although having people like Brooks and Ron Skoog and you know, scattered out and preaching the faith and, and working in the scientific way that I tried to teach has no doubt had a, an impact. Mm -hmm. But if, if you, one single thing, it was that doggone sonar counter that is now used throughout the state. Did you, did you run across any impediments during your career, obstacles along the way? that were frustrating or difficult? No. <clears throat> Not really. Well, making a living as a writer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was pretty tough. It took a long time before I could uh, say that I was making a full-time living. Well, when I got to be outdoors editor of Alaska uh -huh. Magazine. <clears throat> yeah. Now, 
I know you're not doing wildlife management and biology anymore, but do you have any thoughts about how that profession has changed since you started in it? It's changed drastically in that there are probably as many, perhaps more women in the field. When I went to school at Oregon and, and in Maine, in Oregon there was one woman and the rest were mostly GIs from World War II. Mm -hmm. And in Maine, there was not a single woman in the wildlife courses. And when I taught wildlife here, I had a, a number of uh, women in one or two classes as electives, but not as majors in wildlife. One of which was uh, uh, Jill Shepard, who became a uh, managing editor, assistant editor of Alaska Magazine while I was there for many years. 